I might pass over to Liz, who's a wonderful, um, wonderful volunteer of ours who's organised this with a couple of other volunteers all on her own. So we're very thankful. Um, and I'll hand over to you now, Liz. Thanks very much, Ben. Well, welcome everyone. It's uh, great to see a good turnout today. Uh, we've had quite a big response to the, uh, the invitation and I guess a lot of people will be viewing it later on our website. Um, it will be pre-recorded. So if you miss anything, uh, feel free to go back to the website and have a look. Ben will put that link up for you shortly. I uh, just wanted to, first of all, say in the spirit of reconciliation, uh, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Uh, we acknowledge that so sovereignty was never ceded as well. Um, so just a little bit about me, I'm Elizabeth Evans, I've been a vet for about 30 years and uh, I came to vetting I guess because of my love of animals and love of nature and wildlife um, and hence I'm here today because I think that climate change probably um, is going to be the biggest uh, challenge we have both, both for animals and for ourselves in the coming years and already is a big challenge um, and I feel that, that, that volunteering with this group can actually uh, do a lot of good. So uh, hence I'm here to try and um, improve the, the welfare of animals and ultimately it will come down to the human race uh, doing the right thing, I guess. Um, so just in terms of how we're going to run today, uh, obviously I think most of you know how to use Zoom. We do have a chat box. So if you go down to the bottom middle of your screen, you'll see the word chat there. You can click on that. Um, I wouldn't mind if, if you all want to put in a little bit about yourselves, maybe just a, a, like a very one one sentence answer about what you do, um, that would be great. We'll probably stop that in the first five minutes because it does get a bit distracting after a while, but feel free to put it in now while I'm chatting away. Um, you can send messages privately as well if you need to do that, that's absolutely fine. I uh, wanted to uh, first do a bit of a shout out to a couple of new friends that I've made um, through Vets for Climate Action. Um, it's been fantastic to meet people, um, not only who are veterinarians, but also have similar similar interests. So uh, first of all, Anne, thank you so much. Anne, you've been a, a, a really great um, friend to, to have made in the, in the recent uh, past. Um, Jeanette, of course, and Ben. Um, uh, Ben's our CEO and Jeanette's our chair. And we'll, we'll probably uh, cross to Jeanette a bit later in, in the day. Um, also, uh, Leah, Mila, there's, there's many others. So yeah, we've got a really great bunch of volunteers here. And it's, a, it's just been fantastic working with you all. Um, so I guess as veterinary professionals and animal carers, we all love animals. Um, and with 3 billion animals dead in the recent bushfires, uh, I guess we now know that climate change is here. And it seems to be that it will only get worse as time goes on. So um, there's a, a very clear link. The Royal Commission into the bushfires has found a very clear link between climate change and the extent and, and damage and severity of those fires. So uh, there's no doubt that the science is, is there. Um, and recently, even in the last couple of weeks, the AVA has now uh, put together a climate action working group, which, of which I, I and others will be part of. Um, and that's, uh, that's a really good sign. So the profession as a, as a whole is looking at this and they will, I'm sure, come up with uh, you know, a whole lot of recommendations about where the profession should head. In the meantime, we're, we're just a bunch of volunteers people who, who care about, about animals and climate change. So we've come together as a group. And so we, uh, we really would like uh, for you to join us at any stage. And we'll, we'll, get, we'll come to that at, at the end about how you can do that. Um, today's webinar is, uh, will focus on a short summary of the climate science if you're not up to date. And it, it is pretty, um, pretty sobering when you see that information. And then uh, we're gonna cover off on the impact on our wildlife, our livestock and our pets. So firstly, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Professor Leslie Hughes. Uh, she's a distinguished professor of biology and pro vice chancellor at Macquarie University. Uh, she is an ecologist whose main research interest has been the impacts of climate change on species and ecosystems uh, and on, on, on conservation. Uh, she's a former lead author in the IPCC's fourth and fifth assessment report, um, a former federal climate commissioner and now a councillor with the Climate Council of Australia. She's also a director of WWF Australia and the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists. So she comes to us with an incredible amount of knowledge and experience. Um, she was on our last webinar and we love her so much we thought we'd get her back again today. So thank you so much, Leslie, again for your time. Um, but I did have a question for you. I believe that uh, you're an ecologist, which is which is amazing and in interested in conservation, but you owned a pet rabbit for many years, which is, yeah. Now tell us more about that maybe. 
Well, in my defence, it was a request from my daughter for her eighth birthday. So I did feel guilty buying a rabbit. Um, probably the only ecologist in Australia to confess to ever having a pet rabbit, but she was very cute. She lived for another eight years. We looked after her very well. Um, she actually died of Khaleesi virus um, eventually, we think. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm only slightly ashamed of that fact. I'm sure there are many people listening who have treated people's pet rabbits, but thanks, Liz. <laughs> Did you want me to get started? Yes, you can get started. Thank you, Leslie, for that. All right. Um, look, thank you, everybody. Thank you particularly to, to Liz and Ben and Jeanette and others for, for having me back to, to talk to vets. Um, I think it, the vet community are trusted voices in our community. So it's not only really important to connect with you in terms of what you do every day, but you are also um, in a position to be fantastic communicators to your customers. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end and, and offer some tools. Um, as Liz said, I've, I'm a biologist. Um, I actually got into biology for the same reason that you all got into vet, which was a passion for animals. I went down a slightly different uh, route, uh, majored in zoology and ecology at university. And I've been in that ever since. But when I finished my PhD, I was looking for something new to do. And this was the early 90s, and it was suggested that climate change might be sort of an interesting topic in the future. And I thought that there might be a job in that. And so I got into this area very early. Um, but of course, once you get into climate change research and action, um, I'm afraid you never get out of it. I've said it's a bit like the Hotel California. Um, I'm coming to you from Sydney uh, today, so I'm on Gadigal land of the Eora Nation, so I would also like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Okay, um, I'm going to share my screen now. I'm going to show you some slides and talk and then I'm really happy to answer questions at the end. So I think Liz is going to be monitoring those questions as they come into the chat, so don't hold back. So I'm just going to share my screen. And off we go. So this is what I want to talk about today briefly. I'll give you a quick summary of the latest climate trends and projections and then talk about impacts both now and into the future on wildlife, livestock and pets. Well, we now have nearly 50% more CO2 in the atmosphere than we did at the start of the Industrial Revolution. And the impacts of that are all around us. I'm going to show you a little graphic now, which basically shows you for every um, country in the world, and they're arranged in alphabetical order, so Australia's about halfway along the first row, the difference between the temperature, mean temperature in any particular year since 1900 and the average over the period. It will run through um, showing you the cooler years in cool colours and the warmer years in warm colours. It'll take a few seconds, if you'll excuse the pun, to warm up. It'll go through with actual observations until 2018 and then some modelled projections under unmitigated climate change through to the end of the century. I think you'll, you'll get the picture. So that's 2018, and then we have some projections going through to the end of this century. So it's not just average temperatures, though, that are important. Indeed, it's the extremes um, that cause the impacts. And what we are experiencing globally, as well as in Australia, is an increase in the severity and frequency of extreme events. And by extreme events, I mean things like bushfires, tropical cyclones, floods and droughts and heat waves. 
The State of the Climate Report 2020 was just released a couple of weeks ago by the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology, and it shows that Australia has warmed over 1.4 degrees since 2000. Um, sorry, that should say 2000. Um, I think that should say 1910, not 2010. Anyway, uh, over the last 100 years or so, um, we've warmed 1.44 degrees. Last year was the hottest year on record for Australia with mean temperatures 1.52 degrees above average with 10 of the 11 hottest years having occurred since 2005. And that picture there shows the state of Australia on one of the hottest days ever recorded. Unfortunately, last year was also the driest on record. So climate change is changing the distribution and timing of rainfall. Uh, rainfall over the whole continent on average was 40% below average. The future is actually in our hands. So, um, oh, sorry, go back. Um, the temperatures that we've already had are shown there with the black wiggly line. Uh, the coloured projections are entirely dependent on what sort of emissions scenario you use in the climate models. Our best possible chance is shown in that blue line at the bottom. It's known, this is IPCC speak, RCP. It stands for Representative Concentration Pathway. It's just a, an acronym for an emissions pathway. Um, that would potentially keep us to only 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial. Um, under, under the trajectory that we are currently traveling on, we have RCP 8.5, which is that upper orange line, giving us over four degrees by the end of this century. Um, it's very likely that we will end up somewhere in between those two projections. We think about what this actually means for the world in relation to the Paris Climate Agreement. Even at one degree, we are seeing major impacts on things like sea ice and glaciers. Um, at the two degrees, the two degrees is embodied in the Paris Climate Agreement because it's considered to be a boundary um, for very dangerous um, activities uh, above which we do not want to go. Three degrees has been uh, called a situation of outright chaos and four degrees as being incompatible with an organized global community. So that's very, very briefly what we're facing. Let me talk about some of the impacts. And I do, re I am painfully aware as I speak this next section is that virtually everybody listening to me knows more about animal health and animal welfare than I do. So I'm sorry if it comes across like I'm teaching vets to suck eggs, uh, but I'm just trying to pull out some of the really pertinent things about the climate that we might experience in the last few decades in terms of animal health and welfare. Let me start with wildlife. The context of this is that our ecosystems are transforming before our eyes. So I'm going to show you some pictures of ecosystem transformation that don't necessarily directly relate to the sorts of work that vets are doing, but I hope they give you the context of what our wildlife generally is facing. So we are seeing coral reefs bleaching. We've had three major bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef in the last five years. And over that period, we have lost 50% of the live coral cover on the reef. We are also seeing mangroves dying. Mangroves are hugely important fish nurseries. They are also suffering from these underwater heat waves that are also causing the coral bleaching. We are seeing inland our river red gums affected by drought and salinity. It's a combination of climate impacts on top of the over allocation of environmental water to irrigation. A couple of years ago, for example, we saw massive fish mortality in the Menindee Lakes. Once again, a combination of drought conditions and over allocation to irrigation. As sea levels rise, we are seeing salt water 
um, come inland and displace freshwater ecosystems, such as these Melaleuca swamps up in the top end. So places like the Mary River and Alligator River, which is shown here, um, are suffering the impacts of saltwater intrusion. And Kakadu National Park, which is a World Heritage listed area, is only half a metre above sea level, and that is already at risk. And of course, fires are now penetrating into ecosystems that have never experienced fire before. These pictures are from the Tasmanian World Heritage Area, which suffered devastating fires in 2016, where these trees, the kingbilly pines that are over a thousand years old and do not survive fire, um, were killed. So that shows that fire has not been in those systems for the last thousand years at least. And we're seeing even the toughest of eucalypt forests dying back due to heat and drought. And this is an aerial photo of Jarrah forests in Western Australia, and those brown patches are where the eucalypts have died. Now getting on to our wildlife, let me just give you a few examples. So this is how we like to see our wildlife looking healthy and perky. This is how we don't like to see that wildlife. So let me tell you about these three examples. The flying foxes in the barrow are spectacle flying foxes. In a single hot day in Cairns a couple of years ago, I think it was 2018, about a third of the entire population of spectacle flying foxes, which is a threatened species, died in that single day. Most of the deaths were of um, lactating females and young, which are particularly prone to heat stress. Uh, the bottom picture is of the Carnaby's cockatoos. Carnaby's cockatoo is an iconic endangered species in Western Australia, also extremely susceptible to heat stress. Um, and once again, it just takes a single hot day over about 42 degrees for mass mortality to occur. Now the ringtail possums in the upper right hand picture um, actually succumbed very likely to the impacts of drought and heat combined. This was on, these were collected on a beach in Victoria. The possums um, came down to the beach, were so thirsty that they began to drink seawater and of course that killed them. There were over 200 of these possums found by wires um, on a single beach. Of course, a lot of the impacts of climate change on our wildlife will be felt via fire. Now, what this map shows is a trend in what we call the Forest Fire Danger Index, which is a measure used by emergency services to predict fire conditions on a particular day. Um, this shows the trend since about the 1970s. Um, the darker the brown colour, um, the higher the forest fire danger index trend. And what you can see is that especially in the southeastern quarter of the country, though in other parts as well, that forest fire danger index has been going up a great deal. And we saw the impacts of that um, last year and over the summer with the black summer bushfires, which actually started in winter. They weren't just summer fires. Uh, the bushfire season last year in many places started nearly three months ahead of schedule. Um, in total, 18 million hectares uh, were burnt. And to give you some context for that, that's three times the entire size of Tasmania. Um, and it's been estimated by some of my colleagues at Sydney University that about 3 billion vertebrate animals, native vertebrates, mammals, birds and reptiles were killed directly in the fires with many more dying afterwards from lack of shelter and lack of food. Um, death from smoke inhalation in wildlife has been recorded over 50 kilometres away from fire fronts. So it's not just the direct impacts, those impacts really travel over very long distances. And we know that many of our threatened species lost most or all of their habitat, um, including some of the species shown here in those pictures. 
We focus just on koalas, which have been, if you live in New South Wales, you know that koalas have been a very hot political topic uh, lately. So just in New South Wales, about a third of the population is likely to have died in the fires, about 10,000 koalas. On Kangaroo Island, an even smaller um, location uh, with a huge population of koalas, about half of them died, so that was 25,000. Um, with, as I said before, post-fire conditions posing real challenges for um, food and shelter. We also see when animals are brought into rehabilitation centres and wildlife hospitals that they're suffering from a lot of stress, not only due to the direct impacts of fire, but also from, from handling and transport and being housed in what are not very natural conditions. So that's just a little bit about our wildlife. If I move on, and I'll, I'll talk about livestock and pets together because really the impacts, you know, you can't really separate them out from livestock and pets very easily. So here's some of the general impacts. Once again, extreme events um, cause direct mortality. Heat stress can cause metabolic problems, oxidative stress, immune suppression. And then there's a lot of indirect impacts, including the impacts on food and drinking water, both quality and quantity, and on the distribution, transmission, and virulence of pests and pathogens. So let me give you some examples of some of those types of impacts. February 2019, uh, North Queensland floods in, in cattle country are estimated to have killed about 600,000 head of cattle. In the Black Summer bushfires, it wasn't just native wildlife that was affected. Between 50 and 100,000 head of sheep and cattle were lost across New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. And of course, there were probably people on this uh, webinar that were involved in the aftermath and in the euthanasia um, of those stock. Um, heat stress is particularly is, is a problem in general, but it's a particularly a problem for um, livestock grown at high density inside, such as in poultry farms. Uh, it affects um, appetite. Heat stress can reduce appetite um, by uh, affecting things like the expression of the hormone ghrelin. Um, and subsequent weight loss, uh, lethargy and malaise, of course, affect productivity of livestock. Uh, ruminants in particular are subject to um, risk of lameness, various metabolic disorders, respiratory alkalosis and acidosis and altered energy balance um, in high stress conditions. Indoor farm animals, of course, are at risk if something happens to the ventilation and air conditioning systems. And I'll show you an example um, which happened in January 2019, where, where a loss of power um, to the air conditioning system on a poultry farm caused the death of 2,000 chickens um, in a single day. So that these systems are very, very vulnerable to something going wrong with the energy system. In terms of nutrition, nutrition can be affected both positively and negatively um, from climate change. Uh, positively where you get more rain and more pasture growth, of course, but negatively during drought times. It's also the case that as CO2 goes up in the atmosphere, it, re it, it might make plants grow bigger and faster, but it actually reduces the nitrogen content of those plants, affecting uh, protein content and therefore affecting nutrition. So you get more plant, but it is less nutritious at high CO2. Of course, we're getting decreased pasture growth in marginal areas due to drought, increasing the risks of hunger and starvation at its most extreme. Higher temperatures also um, increase the risk of fungal, um, things like endotoxins in feed. Um, and in things like feedlots where supplementary concent concentrates are fed routinely, um, protein digestion can be affected. Um, and body temperature actually increased, also increasing that risk of heat-related in illness. 
We are also seeing uh, impacts on the distribution um, and virulence of many parasites and the vectors that carry disease. We are seeing hotter and more humid conditions, particularly in northern Australia, being more conducive to the spread of parasites and vectors, and that includes mosquitoes, flies, lice, ticks and mites. Obviously, this has implication for pets, such as for heartworm transmission, which is spread by mosquitoes. We're seeing big implications for livestock as things like tropical parasites spread into more southerly areas. This is particularly a concern in terms of cattle ticks. Um, we're also seeing increases in the risk of things like fly strike for sheep. Um, and this is a direct impact of increasing uh, temperature with some research showing that a three degrees increase in temperature is associated with a doubling of incidence of fly strike in lambs and a four times increase in ewes. In terms of pets in cities, we know that we're getting more extreme hot days. In fact, extreme hot days have pretty much doubled, possibly getting on to tripling since about the 1960s. And this means that the thermal neutral zones of many of our pets kept in cities are going to be exceeded for more often and for longer periods. This is especially the case in urban areas which are subject to the urban heat island effect, um, where we can have urban areas um, several degrees hotter on a hot day than surrounding rural areas, basically due to um, surfaces, especially things like black roads and black roofs absorbing more heat. Um, just on footpaths, and this is obviously an impact on dogs being walked, etc., that an ambient temperature of 25 degrees can mean a footpath temperature of more than 50 degrees. So that's something to, to warn our dog owners about in taking their dogs for walks on hot days. Um, the thermal neutral zone, for example, of dogs is between 20 and 30 degrees. Um, for things like guinea pigs, it's lower than that, 18 to 26 degrees with significant heat stress at over 28 degrees. Of course, this vulnerability is affected by many factors, including age, sorry about my phone going off in the background there, uh, pre-existing conditions, uh, breed and reproductive status. Um, behaviour can also be affected, heat stress just as in humans affects sleep patterns, it affects foraging times, um, all sorts of social dynamics and indeed there is evidence that affects the level of aggression uh, both in pets and in humans. Um, pets are also at risk of being displaced during evacuations in extreme events because many evacuation centres actually don't allow pets. This means that people often have to abandon them. This, of course, also increases the risks to humans because understandably uh, pet owners um, delay or refuse to be evacuated if that means leaving their pets behind or their stock abandoned. Um, so that's a sort of a perfect storm of unfortunate um, occurrences. And then I just briefly wanted to mention sport as well, because um, obviously this has impacts uh, for any of you that regularly treat sporting animals. So for thoroughbreds, uh, body temperature increases very sharply during racing. In fact, it goes up by about one degree per minute. In greyhounds, it's even more stark. It goes up by about two degrees in less than the first minute of racing. So obviously racing on hot days um, can put really, really probably unacceptable, unacceptable risks on the health of these animals. Um, I've included in the presentation, and you'll get a copy of these slides, um, a number of references that I've found very useful. This RSPCA one um, that only came out in April this year on the impact of climate change on the welfare of animals in Australia is a really useful global reference. Um, but there's a couple of other links there that I also think uh, might be useful for you. 
Um, I wanted to give a plug to the Climate Council for any of you that are interested in, I realise I've, I've dealt with these issues very, very briefly today. Uh, the Climate Council has been going seven years now. Uh, we've published over 120 reports on just about any climate change related topic that you can think of. Um, so please go to the Climate Council webpage or to the Facebook page. Uh, you can access and share any information on those websites. It's there for you to share. Um, a couple of specific things that I wanted to draw your attention to. As I said at the beginning, uh, vets in the community are really trusted voices. And we know that people like vets, people like doctors, people like emergency workers, um, are those in the community that others look to for advice. So you are all in the box seat for talking to customers and clients about uh, the impacts of climate change. Uh, in, to help you, um, the Climate Council has produced a guide to communicating climate change in Australia. So it's a guide to how to have conversations with people about this topic, which of course at times has been quite controversial, hopefully less so now. Um, we've also published a climate action toolkit on the Climate Council website, which is about the sort of personal action that you can take in your everyday life. Um, so I will leave it there and very much open it up to questions. Thank you.